Good afternoon. This is Between the Lines live at SanduskyRegister.com. My name is Matt Westerhold, a managing editor here at the Register, and my guest today is Dr. Harold Brown, an original Tuskegee Airman and the author of co-author of Keep Your Airspeed Up, about his experiences in World War II and beyond. We're going to talk to Dr. Brown about all of those things in this book. It's a great read. You can get it at Amazon.com or major book retailers across the country. It's just launched this month, and uh, we're going to learn more about it. It's a great read, and Dr. Brown is going to be at a book signing in October, I believe. Yeah, October 14th at 2 p.m. at Faith Memorial Church in Sandusky where all the proceeds from the book signing will go to the Nehemiah Center at Campbell School. We're going to be joined by Dr. Brown in just a moment, but I want to mention that Between the Lines is brought to you by Serving Our Seniors for Erie County residents age 60 and better. If you need help, call Serving Our Seniors at 419-624-1856. And with that, I want to mention that Senior Fest is tomorrow, Friday, at the Erie County Fair out there on Columbus Avenue. Senior Fest from uh, 9 a.m. The festivities start at 10 a.m. And there's a great program, a whole list of programs right through the day, ending at 2.30 with a Senior Fest contest featuring Denny R. and the Living Sound. But at 10.55, there's a skit called Leader of the Pack, uh, Leader of the Pack, and I am in that skit, and I'm a trained and wonderful actor, so you'll please have to come and see that skit. It's very good. Senior Fest at the Erie County Fair. That's tomorrow, beginning at 10 a.m. at the Erie County Fair. Aaron McLaughlin's with us today. Aaron, do you want to say hello? Hello. Aaron, I know I always, always ask you this, but did we take care of all the inside paperwork that we needed to? And that's what you always say to me, so I appreciate it. And with that, we'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Harold Brown. <laughs> Dr. Brown, thank you for being on Between Hi. the Lines. My pleasure. So let me, let me get this uh, fixed here. I'm going to drop this down because I'm not going to need this. Then this is your book, Keep Your Air Speed Up. And this is just, just released this month. That's correct. So how does it feel? To, uh, to have it done. I know you've been working on it a long time. Relieved. 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 It was uh, a tough three years. My part was easy. Marsha did all the work. Your wife. And uh, there were times when it almost broke up the marriage, but not quite. And uh, there Dr. was Marcia a lot of trauma, But uh, we had our moments. Uh, she would say one thing, I would say another. But we always manage to come up with the right solution, I hope, and the correct solution for the book. But uh, we are relieved. It was that, that a tough done. three years. And now you're on. You're on. A, you're going to tour and do book signings uh, across the country. You're in Alabama, I think, pretty soon. The where the Tuskegee Institute is. Thirty-five miles east of Montgomery. East of Montgomery in Alabama. What is a Tuskegee Airman? For those who don't know, <laughs> how, how, how would you describe what a Tuskegee Airman is? Well, very, very simply, it was a group of black guys who wanted to fly airplanes. But since we could not fly with the white guys, we had to have our own air force. There was, so it was we segregated. Had, we were totally segregated. We had our hospital, MPs, everything it takes to run a base. We had it all there, some close to 12, 14,000 support people. At the Tuskegee Institute? Uh, yes, uh, to and support you, the whole effort. And you were, you knew from an early age that you wanted to fly. I got the bug, I was bit by the bug when I was in the sixth grade. Uh, my mother sent me on a piano stool. You know mothers, oh, he's going to be a pianist and yak and yak. When I had no talent for it, really. But uh, in the sixth grade, I described it as having a love affair with an airplane. And I fell in love with it. And uh, at that point, I began, you know, everyone builds all the model airplanes mm -hmm. and so forth. And I read every book that I could possibly find about airplanes. And that's the way it was. Uh, 
all the way up until the time that I graduated from high school. Now, the interesting thing was is that they wanted college uh, graduates when they first started the program back in 1941. It was announced in March of 1941 it was going to happen. And they named the first class in July of 1941. And how old were you in 1941? I was 16 years 16 old. 16 years old. 16. I was a junior then, uh, saved up $35, went down and took five flying lessons. So five lessons for $7 each. $7 each. Big money in those days. While you were still a teenager, while you were still in high school, you took flying lessons. Yes. Uh, and this was, this was in 1941? 1941. And then you graduated high school. In 42, 17 years old, in June 42. And you decided to... Um... At that point, I immediately went down and signed up because they immediately ran out of pools of college men and they needed pilots in the mm -hmm. worst way. So they reduced it and said we would take high school graduates, which of course I was. And once that, went, that happened, I immediately went down to set for the exams, I passed them. I turned 18, went back, took my uh, final uh, uh, physical examination, passed it, and uh, within the next uh, four or five months, in December of 1942, I got a letter and said I had been selected for flight training. And then the flight training began? I left home uh, in the second week of January. Went down to Bluxy, Mississippi for six weeks of basic training. At Tus oh, at Mississippi. I mean, yes, in Bluxy, Mississippi. And there was a mob of guys, some 600 of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were there in, oh, approximately six weeks or so. And then up to Tuskegee Institute. Because once they decided to take high school, kids they said they had no college. Mm -hmm. So they started a program along with that. And we were so-called college aviation students and anyone that came into that program they had a variety across the country mm -hmm. at uh, a variety of universities and colleges. Mm -hmm. uh, ours was selected at Tuskegee obviously because the air base that we were being trained at, Tuskegee Army Airfield was just eight miles up the road from Tuskegee Institute. Okay, so this is 1942? This is 1943 Okay, now. 1943. Yeah. And so how long were you in training at the Tuskegee and through that process? Well, I stayed there for about four, four and a half months, then went up to the airfield where I then became a Army Air Corps cadet. Mm -hmm. And I was officially in the program. Mm -hmm. The program had four phases, uh, pre-flight, which was non-flying, then primary, basic, advanced. Each of the phases were approximately 10 weeks long. So the program lasted just about 40 weeks. At that time, I graduated in May 23rd, 1944, mm -hmm. 19 years old, second lieutenant, and I had my wings. You had your wings. And then what happened? Well, from there, we went down to fighter training for a couple of months down to Wallaboro. And uh, we trained in the P-47 because the fighter group over the 332nd had just switched from P-39s they were using for patrol duty over in Naples. They had moved over to Ramatelli. They had now joined the 15th Air Force to escort bombers. So they had a change of equipment and they went to the P-47. Okay. And the P-47 and the P-38s were the two primary fighters okay. at that time. They only had them for a month, they switched equipment again and they brought in the 51. Okay. But, and what is this? And that is the P-51, the airplane that I, f that uh, we flew all of our missions in, except for the first month they flew the P-47. Okay, so this is the plane and you were shipped overseas? Yes, uh, I went overseas in, uh, I think I left in September uh, took some 32 days, crossed the Atlantic. We finally saw the rock of Gibraltar. Thank goodness, after 32 days out on that, with a big convoy, we were in Liberty ships with destroyers escorting us over. We finally went to the rock of Gibraltar, and a few days later, we wound up at Oran, Africa. Stayed there for three or four days, boarded another ship, went up to Naples. After three or four days, landed in Naples. 
then it took us a couple of weeks to get over the Ramatelli. Okay. So it took us almost six weeks from the time that we boarded those ships until we arrived in Ramatelli. And what were you thinking? You know, what, what were you thinking was going to be your future when you're on that ship? And, and you, I bet you're thinking, when are we going to get there? Well, the interesting thing is this. With my class, they had an emergency requisition for pilots, mm -hmm. which came over from the 332nd, you know, down through the chain of command. Okay. They took my class, 44E, the only class they had done this with. There were 30 of us. They divided us in half. I was part of the 15 that was selected. Mm -hmm. They accelerated our program in advance so that the final two weeks of our program, we flew from the T-6, which was our advanced trainer, we transitioned into the P-40, the first fighter that we flew. Okay. We did that all as cadets. And then when I graduated, we all graduated, but half of my class went home for a leave, came back, and went through the same P-40 transition that I did okay. all as a cadet. So I went straight off to fighter school, the 15 of us. The rest of the class had to come back for a couple of weeks to do the P-40, and then they met us down in Wallaboro, South Carolina. Okay. But they were about two to three weeks behind us All right. because of that. So it's interesting, what was an emergency requisition? It takes us six weeks. It takes you six <laughs> weeks to get And that. you'd think they would have flown us over Do you something. recall your <laughs> first mission? Yes, I do. It was <laughs> with a, a guy by the name of, uh, of Captain um, John, I believe his name was Davis, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. It's been a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But I can remember so well, um, uh, I was his wingman that day, and uh, he said, now, Harold, uh, you just stick right with me. Don't do anything. You just stick with me, and everything's going to be just fine. So I flew his wing on that first mission, and... Uh, it was without incident, it was a long mission. I can remember it was about six and a half hours or so from the time of takeoff we got back home. And uh, we didn't see enemy, any enemy aircraft. We just had all the bombers that we were protecting, went all the way up, brought the bombers back in, no incidents, no nothing. And I thought, boy, this is a piece of cake, this is pretty easy. But then you learned later yes, that there was more to it. <laughs> there than was that. more to it than that. <laughs> Talk about uh, when you crashed. The, I think the second time uh, the, when, when, with the constable. Talk a little bit about that leading up to that, because there's a section. I th this book is written in in uh, it's it's a narrative, and it's it's really a, a, a good read, interesting, and it's conversational. And I know your, your wife helped make that possible, certainly. Yes. And I want to read a portion of it. And I mentioned to you what portion I want to read. Why don't you lead okay. us up into that? Uh, it was on my 30th mission. And uh, it was a special mission designed by the 15th Air Force. And it was handed down to the 332nd Fighter Group to do it. And there was a particular area just south of Linz, Austria, about 100 miles south. It was all railroad traffic very heavily traveled. And uh, they gave the mission, uh, the 332nd, uh, when they got the mission, they selected the 99th Fighter Squadron to run the mission. I was in the 99th at that time. Took off early in the morning, flew up uh, to Linz, uh, Austria, and just about 100 miles south of Linz, Austria, that was our target, and we caught them by surprise. And we could see numerous locomotives. It was the winter time. You could see the steam coming up out of the locomotives. And I can remember we saw it, and the one that guy was howling and said, Oh, look what we just found. Because you were, you, oh, your mission was to destroy them. Was to destroy them. To, and the we caught chain. them all out in the open. Okay. And one of the guys howled, Look what we just found. Uh huh. Boy, DFC Day, here we go. And uh, DFC Day. Distinguished Flying Cross. Day. Okay, We all were right. all going to have a ball that day. All right. And there were uh, f five uh, four-ship flights. We had 21 uh, ships that we put up that day, maximum effort. And we dropped one flight off. I was in the lead flight with Major Campbell. 
we drop one flight, go 15 miles, drop off another flight, another flight, until we got all the way up at, at the northern end. And we could just hear the guys, uh, boy, here comes one. I just got one. Did you see that one blow up? There was all this chatter. This chatter. is chatter on your radio frequencies. All on the radio. Okay. Yeah. And we had a very successful day. So now the Lee flight is now coming back, heading south, and he's picking up the flights. They had pretty much destroyed all the targets in their area. Right. And we're picking up all of the flights. And now we're circling and we're getting ready to head for home. And it's always that last one. Someone said, hey, there's one down there you guys missed. And uh, Bill Campbell said, let's go get him, Harold. I was his wing man. Okay. And he was the uh, squadron commander. We went down on the target, and uh, I could see smoke coming out of his guns, but he immediately broke off and says, I'm out of ammunition. I said, well, I got a few bullets left. So I went in on the target, and I had that locomotive lit up like a Christmas tree. Because uh -huh. every time you hit, you see the sparkle. Uh -huh. I had it lit up. And just as I passed over, I thought, why doesn't it blow? Why doesn't it blow? And I was just getting ready to break off from it. And as I passed over, that's when it blew up. And I was right on top of the explosion. Ah. So all of the junk which came from hit the explosion. You? Yeah, it damaged my aircraft. Uh, it ran for just about a couple of minutes. I got to about a thousand feet. Uh, the oil pressure goes down to zero. The oil temperature is spiking to the right. Then I lost all my coolant. It was for a so you know you're in trouble. Engine. Oh, I'm in deep, deep trouble. That was evident. Then when I lost the coolant, there wasn't any. I knew that was the end of the road for me. So. You do what you're normally trained to do. You, you pull them nose up, you jettison the canopy, you roll it over, you kick the stick forward, it throws me out. I pull the chute, and the chute works. The chute works. Thank goodness. So that was a nice relief, and the guys were circling me as I was coming down. I could see them sitting in that airplane, and they were waving at me as they circled me. And then they took off and went home, and I remember landing in the snow. It was so deathly quiet, and I could hear those airplanes slowly dying, and I thought, what in the world am I doing up here? There's a war going on, and I'm looking like this. I'm an No, what do you mean looking the, like this? Me, a black a guy black man. up here in Germany. In Germany. 20 years old. In the snow. Old, in the old. snow. I've got no business up here. Now what? And you, and you said to yourself, what are you going to do now, Harold? That's it, exactly. Because you have a tendency to, to speak like that. What are you going to do now, Harold? And, and so then the what happened? Well, within a short while, a couple of constables came up over the hill, a lot of snow, and they saw me down at the bottom of the hill, right where the forest begins, a lot now of trees. Now, these were German constables. Yes. And they were on skis. Yeah, they had skis, and they jumped off the skis, and they saw me down there, and they the rifle put a rifle on me, and I... Immediately, I had a gun and I threw it away. Oh, I had a beautiful 45 all silver plated. I threw it away. They always said, if you got a gun, throw it away. It's useless anyway. Uh -huh. So just don't get caught with a gun. Uh -huh. Why? I don't know. It might upset them or whatever. Uh -huh. So I threw it away. They put the gun on me. They picked me up. They bring me back to the village, a village, and it's one that we had uh, strafed. And strafe, we weren't meaning strafing. you bombed it. Yeah. No, no bombs, just, uh, just the six guns. Okay. Straight. All right. Each of the 51s carried the six 50 caliber guns. Okay. But we weren't shooting at civilian targets. Right. But with bullets flying all over the place, locomotives blowing all over the place, all this damage, shrapnel all over the place, who knows what happened? Not could have, shrapnel could have hit a guy's wife, right. his kid. And then here comes this guy in a parachute. a parachute. Well, you Looking can like imagine, this. Looking man, like this. who is this? Well, <laughs> obviously, they wanted a piece of me. So a crowd started gathering. There was a crowd that met us as we walked in the village, about 35 or so. And uh, I couldn't speak German, but they were extremely, extremely angry and very vocal. Agitated. But I can understand this. I can understand this. They had ski poles and they were 
you know. They wanted to kill you. They made it very clear that they had murder on their mind because and they, they were made certain that I knew precisely knew what it. was going to happen. And, uh, and so what, what were you thinking at this point? What are you going to do now, Harold? I'm something there, you know. I mean, are you... I are think you, at times I was almost in a state of shock, right, really. Right, right. Because I was standing there, well, what are you going to do, Harold? I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, you got to do something. Well, what are you going to do? You got to think of something, Harold. I'm talking to myself. Well, I can't run. Where am I going to run to? Where am I, you know, I guess I'm just going to die. And I guess when they get ready to kill me, I'll just react and either shoot me or something. Right. Well, and that was my thinking. And uh, there was a perfect hanging tree. I can see that tree today. And I assume that that's the spot they were going to hang me They were going to take you to. And there's 75, 100 people about? Well, no, about 35, okay. 40, just a, just a small okay. crowd. A nice hanging crowd, okay. really. So, uh, and, you, and you write in the book that you were surprised, you know, and that and you did some research and that soldiers, you know, they, they expected to die or, or they wouldn't be surprised by death, but as a, as a uh, research indicated that people who were captured were just surprised they were captured and didn't know what to do. And you're in that situation you're and now you've right. got a group, you, you've basically got a group that wants to kill you and then what happens? Well, there was a constable, there was a gentleman in the back, and I just glanced at him, paid no attention to him at all. Next thing I knew, I felt a hand on my shoulder. He snatched me back, he steps in front of me, he puts a round in his rifle, and he puts the rifle on the crowd. Now, you can imagine the constable there, he knew everybody in that right. crowd. Might even had some of his own relatives He's, in he's that like crowd. the local police right officer. There. He was, yeah. So they're screaming at each other. He at them, they at him. And they're hollering at him and he's screaming at him and he's holding them off with the gun. And we are backing up and we back up, oh, I don't know, what would amount to a couple of blocks, two or three mm -hmm. blocks, to a small pub. We go in the pub, we chase, he chased everybody out, we barricaded ourselves in there. And then let me read, let me pick that up right from there and I'll read this passage from uh, Keep Your Air Speed Up available at Amazon.com and local uh, book retailers, national book retailers, and at book signings coming up. And you'll read about that in tomorrow's register. Uh, let me just read this passage. Um, the constable and I moved the heavy furniture, the big oak tables and heavy chairs in order to barricade ourselves in. The crowd broke out windows, but they couldn't get in because there were bars on them. It was already late afternoon and the sun was going down. It was mid-March and cold outside. The crowd began to disperse. We stayed in the barricaded pub until about midnight when it had grown quiet. We assumed most of the villagers had gone home. The constable and I went out the back door and walked about two to three miles to another small village. The constable made a phone call and within four hours, two soldiers came to pick me up. As the soldiers took me away, I saw the constable for the last time. He had saved my life. If he had wanted to hurt me, all he had to do was turn his back and just left the mob to do what it wanted. I was the enemy. I wasn't his enemy at the time. As the district constable, I was his responsibility. I just love that passage. Mm -hmm. and it, it says a lot about you know, the, the moments of war. I mean, that was, that was your moment between life and death. It was. And the one thing I regret, as a young man when I came home, I never thought about going back to Germany. As I grew older and older and older, I thought, Harold, you need to just take a couple of weeks, go back to Germany, go back to that village. And find him. And find that man and say thank you. But I never did. Never did. But he, he it was a, a, an act of valor. No, it was. And you came back from the war, and you had a, a career in academia. Um, talk a little bit about that. Well, I retired in uh, uh, May 31st, 1965. I started uh, with a little school. It was down in Columbus, Ohio. CAT, Columbus Area Technician School, and mm -hmm. it was almost like a grade 13, 14. Mm -hmm. They were in the basement of Central High School. Three programs, 67 students, 12 faculty members, 
when I first went down When you there. started. Yes. Uh, we relocated up to Aquinas High School that summer. We moved up there and we started that fall quarter with about 500 students. Uh, I stayed there with them within about six weeks. Uh, that was when it was announced we were going to put a man on the moon. The two electronics instructors, and I was in the electronics department, uh, left. They had offers they just couldn't refuse. They left. The director came to me and said, Harold, won't you train in electronics? I said, yeah, I was an electronics officer and whatnot. They said, do you think you could handle it? I said, well, I'll tell you what. I had about 1,500 students and about 40 instructors. I think I can handle this little department with 67 <laughs> students and myself as one uh -huh. instructor, certainly. So I took it over and I became chairman of the electronics department. Then I moved up as we grew to dean of the engineering and uh, eventually became the vice president in 1974. And I remained the vice president until I retired in 1986. When I retired, we had about 10,000 students. Today, Columbus State Community College mm -hmm. has more than 30,000 students, the largest community college in, in the, the state, state of, of Ohio. Ohio. And uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going back there on the 22nd of August uh, as, a, uh, as a book signing. Very good. And we're going to have a story. Into now, Tom Jackson, our reporter, wanted me to ask you about on Monday in the Sandusky Register, we're going to have our historic page, uh, the, uh, which is the page uh, after the first atomic bomb was dropped on Japan. And Tom mentioned uh, that on the same day of our news coverage of the atomic bomb drop, there was a story about Dick Ball. Dick Ball. Do you yeah. remember who Dick he Ball was? was? The Ace of Aces. The if Ace I, of Aces. I, I believe he had 40 victories, if I'm not mistaken, but he was the Ace of Aces. And, he and, was a top man. And he, he was a test pilot, and he died uh, about that same time. And in, in the Register Historical page on Monday, you'll see that story and the story of the at atomic bomb drop. Mm -hmm. So I want to, um, I lost my train of thought there. Your, your wife is co-author, Dr. Marsha Bordner, mm -hmm. uh, the um, President Emeritus, Emeritus at uh, Terra Tech Community College, Terra Tech State College. Terra State Community. And she's here with us today, but she's your co-author. And this book is available at Amazon.com. Keep Your Air Speed Up by Dr. Harold Brown, a Tuskegee Airman, the story of a Tuskegee Airman. It's a great read. Uh, Dr. Brown has been at the Nehemiah Center to talk to the children there. That's where we met him. And so I'm glad you were able to be on the program today. Pleasure. Congratulations uh, on the book. I know it was a lot of work. And uh, have you talked about movie rights yet with anybody? Uh, not yet, but I'm open for any offer. <laughs> is there someone you want to play yourself? Well, uh, I don't know if there's anyone quite handsome enough to take my <laughs> spot, you know, but we'll find somebody. All you right. Know. <laughs> it, it, you know, it's a great read. Uh, Keep Your Airspeed Up, The Story of a Tuskegee Airman, Dr. Harold Brown. Uh, there's a book signing on October 14th at Faith Memorial Church, and all profits will go to the Nehemiah Center from that book signing. Get tomorrow's register. Uh, for more information about book signings that Dr. Harold Brown and his wife are going to be at in the weeks ahead. Dr. Brown, thank you so much for being pleasure. on the program. It's so good to it see you again, pleasure. and I appreciate knowing you, and I appreciate thank knowing you. your story. Thank the you. book's a great read, Amazon.com. Keep your airspeed up, the story of a Tuskegee Airman.